published author of three books, hosts daily video conferences with students around the world, inspires teachers around the country. Please welcome to the upstage our youngest presenter ever, Adora Zvitek. Many adults can only envy. 
that saying about old dogs and new tricks? I found out dogs fall, so I actually made a study, which means that you too can have those qualities if you don't already. Perhaps a great example of honesty, the first thing in my mind when I thought about that was that childhood classic, The Emperor's New Clothes. Maybe you remember it. Here's a short quote. So now the emperor walked under his high canopy in the midst of the procession, and all people cried out, Oh, how beautiful are our emperor's new clothes! What a magnificent train there is to the mantle, and how gracefully the scarf hangs. In short, no one would allow that he could not see these much admired clothes, because in doing so, he would have declared himself either a simpleton or unfit for his office. Certainly, none of the emperor's various suits had ever made so great an impression as these invisible ones. And now what happened? But the emperor has nothing at all on, said the little child. Listen to the voice of innocence, exclaimed his father, and what the child had said was whispered from one to another, and it goes on, and all the people catch on. And, and then the lords of the bedchamber took greater pains than ever to appear holding up a train, although in reality there was no train to hold. Maybe the moral of Hans Christian Andersen's beloved story was not so much or not entirely about flattery and deception as it was about learning from kids. You never know. We've all seen examples of blunt honesty from kids before. One of my fondest childhood memories is when my sister and I got a new teeter, tutor, Felisa. And my sister, we were sitting down one day, we went her Spanish, and then uh, my sister just looked at her and said, God, you have a kind of big nose. And I was just sitting there, like, you shouldn't have said that. Um, and she did, of course, say, sorry. Am I advocating that kids like my sister at a young age should be allowed to just say whatever they want to adults, no matter whether it's hurtful? Or impolite? No. But there's a big difference between merely not uttering something impolite or inconsiderate and lying, flattering, and sucking up that we see so often from adults and in large companies. <laughs> <laughs> what am I talking about? Just think back to the oil spill. It seems so far away now, but I saw this evidenced with BP's reaction to the oil spill. Their barrels of oil's leaked estimate just kept on climbing and climbing. And I mean, these were huge numbers. But even with these huge numbers, you weren't always sure of time and time again whether they were telling the truth. And time and time again, it seemed like they weren't. We needed blunt honesty. If not from BP, but maybe from one of our regulatory agencies. We needed a you have a big nose moment for BP. <laughs> and what happened? One politician actually apologized to BP for the fact that the government had made them set up a relief fund. Honesty motivates people to act. Pretending the problems are smaller than they really are just makes us delay. It made me kind of think back to what David Eagleman was saying about you know, short-term thinking, long-term thinking. And honesty definitely really gets you to act. From what we've seen so far, maybe it's not surprising that one of the quickest responders to the Gulf oil spill was not an adult at all, but a kid. Olivia Wooler started drawing pictures of birds that she would give to people who had donated to the Audubon Society's emergency fund because she loved the birds in the Gulf and she wanted to help. Like Olivia, when you see a problem, you should solve it, not wait and dilly-dally and put out ads for the sake of PR or company brand. Any guesses on how much uh, BP ultimately spent on ads? I'm hearing silence. Well, BP, according to CNN, <coughs> they spent close to $100 million on ads alone. One thing that many criticize those top <coughs> officials for, notably, I almost feel sorry for him now, but notably Tony Hayward, who said he wanted his life back, was a lack of empathy for both the human and animal populations, the small businessmen, the fishermen, and the people, the citizens of the Gulf, affected by the spill. Something that such officials and the heads of companies all around the world, heads of companies perhaps like you sitting here today, could learn from kids is that truly it shouldn't be just about the money, but rather the impact that your organization has on the world. Is it positive? Is it negative? If it's negative, then it's time to make a change. <coughs> Has anyone here heard of the term cause marketing? Just raise your hand if you have. I see some raised hands. So we actually heard Jessica Jackley talk a little bit about how there was the corporate social responsibility, and companies are looking to, I don't know if this is sort of like buying carbon credits when you fly a plane, you feel bad about that, but there's this corporate um, social responsibility. And cause marketing has become a fairly common marketing practice with companies doing good, uh, donating percentages to charity, go friendly, costly methods, um, whatever it may be. And I love to see companies do good. I think the business can really provide a great ally to charity and to doing good in the world. 
But at the same time, I have to sometimes ask, is it pure motivation to make the world better all the time? Or is it for brushing up your public image? Or saying, here, look at this, I'm doing good. And if it's for the latter, if it's for the PR, then it works. Because I know I bought chocolate bars from companies that donate to animal sanctuaries or something like that. And don't get me wrong, I embrace cause marketing. But many kids with their own nonprofits are embracing the help the world part first before a profit or a profit margins. Um, we were just hearing about how the, uh, Generation Y was really into building these new greenhouses. There are some examples of kids who have started their own nonprofits as well. Austin Rewind started Hoops of Hope, which is like a walkathon for basketball free throws, and it helps to buy school supplies and emergency aid for countries uh, faced by natural disasters, AIDS, etc. And he founded this after hearing about children orphaned by AIDS and how he would feel if he lost his parents, demonstrating that quality of empathy. The reason I'm sharing an example of Austin and his story is because of, of what I see as a lack of entirely pure motivation to take care of our world. If there was no positive brand image, no gaining profit margins, no PR, whatever, it associated with companies uh, charitable giving, then I want you to think about how many companies would still continue those giving campaigns. And I'm not saying that they wouldn't. I mean, I think a lot of companies might. It's, and it's entirely possible some are doing out of their hearts. But the infamous Tony Hayward once said, our primary purpose in life is to create value for our shareholders. Probably many companies look at social responsibility and helping the world as a means to an end. More money, better PR, more customers. I would argue that money is merely a means and that helping the world should be our goal. We can tack it all down to empathy, but not all of us have founded charities, donated proceeds, or gone on campaigns for the benefit of others. Perhaps when Olivia Buller drew her first birds, or when Austin Gutwein threw his first hoop for hope, they didn't think about what challenges might lie ahead of them, and we can all learn from this kind of fearlessness. The courage it takes out to set on ventures when, when you don't know the outcome, will I fail, will I succeed, that's courage that we really don't have enough of. Just think of a time you had an idea. It could be this week, it could be last month, it could be last year, whenever. Think about a time you struck it down with that club of self-doubt, that murderous dagger, and there's no way that'll happen. Over time, we just get used to hearing those words, and we begin to believe them. Obviously, no one bothered to tell there's no way that'll happen to Mia Alexander and William Campuamo, or if they did, these two were still strong enough to believe in themselves and in their ideas. So here's a riddle. What can you make out of blue gum trees, an old bicycle, and lots of scrap metal? Well, if you're William Campuamo, then that equals wind turbine. Yeah, a wind turbine. <laughs> I thought there was something seriously wrong with that, with that equation, but William Campuamo was the then 14-year-old Malawian who, after having to leave school because his parents could no longer afford the tuition, decided uh, that he, would, he wanted to go to the library, learn about electricity, and reading a book, he saw uh, how wind turbines work, and through his environmentally friendly efforts, he was able to light up his village. Amiya Alexander, like William, embodies that fearless creativity and go-to attitude that we can all aspire to. Think about what you got your kids or your relatives for Christmas this year. Unless you're Amiya Alexander's mom, I'm betting that it wasn't a big bus. This bus was the launching pad for Amiya's business and the start of her dream. You see, she runs a mobile dance bus where she gives low-cost or free lessons to other kids about how they can get moving, and a goal of fostering love of exercise and movement to combat obesity. While well, I might call asking for a bus for Christmas rather irrational, we might say, in fact, there's no way that'll happen, it's important to realize that beginnings, irrational or not, can lead to great things. Some would argue that irrational thinking has gotten us into a lot of problems in the first place. I would argue that you need to fight fire with fire. These are desperate times, and that requires sometimes desperate thinking. Using an old bike and car parts to bring power to Africa, irrational. Getting a bus for Christmas and then fighting obesity with it is irrational. But a village without electricity and kids deprived of fitness opportunities, that is unacceptable. Their kind of unrestrained thinking has the potential to give us new medicines, new innovations, and ultimately new, a better world. You know, new thinking, new attitudes, innovation, creativity, and maybe sometimes irrationality provide the fuel for the engine of progress. Kids can be brimming with interesting, creative ideas. We just need an outlet. For me, that outlet was writing. For others, like my sister Adriana, it might be music. For countless others, it could be science, math, or any other area. 
Creativity is directly tied in with resourcefulness. We've heard a lot about creativity and its importance. I want to, uh, again, say this. If you still think that it's not very important, which I kind of find impossible, but if you still think it's not very important, uh, think of it this way. What kind of employee would you rather have for your company? Someone who's resourceful and who can make the most out of any situation, or one who can only do what they're ordered to do from step-by-step -step instructions? It seems too often that we're raising kids to become number two. A child's world today is saturated with passive activities, well, let's fight in moderation. It's not good when the only fun you have is sitting in front of a screen. My sister and I have a new cousin, Maya, she's really cute, and we often contrast our baby and early childhood to hers. So we didn't have the coolest toys or organic clothes, but I honestly don't envy all of that. You see, my sister and I had a few very important childhood toys. We had wooden blocks, styrofoam, great outdoors, and most importantly, our imaginations. With these, we put together play scenarios, since you can see we're using uh, old envelopes, recycling, being green, uh, to make our crowns over there. And we would go outside and pretend the tree leaves were our currency. We would uh, pretend to be mummies or play dress up or go outside in the garden. And we would uh, create mud canals. And it was fun. My parents didn't restrict us to tell us we couldn't drag the dining room chairs to the living room or we couldn't get all dirty outside. And we were utilizing our creativity to an extent that would help us in later life. But did we think about that then? No. We were just too busy having fun in our man-made, well, kid-made mud canals. But my efforts to get adults to listen and learn from kids isn't just about fond memories of childhood mud sculpture. It goes beyond that. It's a larger part of my efforts to get adults to pay attention to our voice. It's my belief in America's essential tenets of democracy. Our country is built up on the belief that everyone should have a voice. And by listening to kids, we are embracing what is at the heart of a democratic society. The idea that everyone should have a voice and a say. By including us in your conversations, you're not only including us, and hearing ideas you might otherwise not hear, you're making us more motivated to become involved with issues. I know that um, some of you who were here last year heard David Paul from Obama's campaign speak. One of the perennial uh, challenges of a lot of campaigns that I see is getting young people out to vote, whether it's because the politicians just seem too old or the issues don't really affect us. Obama's campaign seemed to find that magic bullet to fight it. By getting so many young people involved in their campaign, even young people not old enough to vote, like junior high and high school students, Obama's campaign sparked momentum around the nation. A lot of people pin his success down to social media, and that definitely um, had a big part of it, or a nation having the Bush administration, but I think that another crucial ingredient of that uh, developing part of success was the fact that they got young people interested and involved. And when we're included, we really get involved on a massive scale. The ideal adult response is obvious. Adults will take kids seriously, listen to our ideas. Kids will learn from adults, and adults will learn from kids. What's the reality? It depends. If you're not lucky, if you're not one of the Mia's, Williams, Austin's, Olivia's out there, then it may be, be quiet, that's stupid, don't touch that, go away. And that's what's preventing adults from learning from kids. I mean, just try having a conversation with someone who puts their hand over their mouth and says, don't want to hear that. Too many kids have to face this challenge because of the metaphorical hands over mouths. The restrictive attitudes toward kids like me on the part of adults, whether from parents, schools, or societies. Too many adults don't bother to include youth, even on issues like education. This is one of the best opportunities to get students involved. So maybe you don't have to ask us about the sewer systems, but at least in the classrooms where we're sitting down and learning every day, then I think that it's an excellent area. The voice of the student can provide some of the clearest insights of all, above the voice of the government official or one of our teachers or parents. I think that because we're the ones who sit in the classroom chairs and listen to the lesson, we have that first person insight. Maybe one of the reasons that students complain that school is, as Dan said, boring, is because we don't have a say in how it's taught. When I go to education conferences, like the Florida Education Technology Conference, I was one of the most recent, then I have to be escorted onto the conference floor because their insurance doesn't cover kids. They don't expect kids to be at a conference, an education conference, which should be serving them. So such roadblocks when it comes to trusting kids and allowing us to have a say and giving us responsibility are roadblocks when it comes to learning from us, too. Why this prevalently restrictive attitude? Our bodies are growing, so why don't our minds and our dreams? 
Yet, when the average kid says that they want to do more than eat, sleep, study, maybe publish a book or start a company, then many adults would probably say, wait until you're older. You may have noticed it's always, what do you want to do when you grow up, not what are you doing right now? Ultimately, some of our greatest ideas came from kids who didn't defer their dreams for the sake of a so-called average childhood, and whose parents didn't defer them either. To change the way we look at youth, all of us, you and I, must realize what we can learn from those who are younger than you are. we are. Here are all the examples of kids who have done great things. You might think, well, that's all very fine and dandy, but the kids that I know haven't done those things. They haven't started charities or founded companies. They don't show those qualities. But I would say to that, haven't you ever seen kids point out signs that you'd be afraid to warn clash of colors together because they didn't care what other people thought, been princesses and ballerinas interchangeably? I do not say that we are always honest, fearless, resourceful, or creative, and I certainly don't say that adults are never so. But I know that many, looking at the examples of kids' accomplishments which I put forth, might say they're not average kids, they're exceptions. Truly though, each one of the kids I introduced to you is an average kid. The difference is not that we had ideas, the difference is that somewhere, someone out there listened. Today, I'm here speaking it up because David Eagleman and Cheryl and Ernie Rapp listened. My generation is facing ever-increasing challenges. In order to ensure the success of our shared future, millions of young people need you to become that someone. An old Chinese proverb says, paraphrase, when you go on a journey with three people, you will always find your teacher. I'm betting that at least one of the people on that journey with you is a kid. I spoke in the introduction about how the best relationships are reciprocal. Just as you expect us to learn from and listen to you, I hope that every one of you in the room today can listen to you and learn from us. In Victorian times, children were expected to be seen and not heard. But I would ask this, if we are always mute, how do we learn? Thank you. This country has a bright future with you, so leave it. Thank you very much.